Woburn. Today, Representative Rich Haggerty and Mayor Scout Galvin have joined me because we're going to talk about a whole bunch of important city updates. We have reached some new phase of our pandemic recovery, and so there's lots of things going on, as well as some additional other city business, including some changes to our Ward 4 Alderman. So thank you both for joining me. Today, we'll start with you, Rich. Thanks for having me, Sam. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really glad you joined me. Um, before we started recording, um, Rich and I were having a really, um, I think, productive and important conversation about what phase three means to, in the state of Massachusetts, um, and particularly how long phase three might last, because it could be a, quite an extended period of time. Rich, why don't you um, just touch base a little bit from your perspective about what phase three moves us into, and then I also do want to talk about some really great legislation that has passed around voting. Yeah, so I, I know we were just touching base a little bit on the uh, phase three uh, beginning today. And uh, again, similar to the other phases that we've went through, then there's kind of multiple parts. Uh, and, uh, you know, today with regards to, uh, you know, museums and uh, some kind of larger venue, uh, you know, maybe bowling alleys, um, you know, gyms, places that uh, you'd see a little bit larger capacity. Um, and naturally, there's uh, capacity limitations. I think it's eight people per uh, a thousand square feet up to 25 people uh, and then obviously cleanliness um, uh, requirements as well uh, and clean, appropriate cleaning uh, and appropriate social distancing um, you know clear guidelines if you will that uh, that these facilities are expected to accommodate and uh, and provide to make sure that the public stays safe so uh, we're going through that now and hopefully they'll begin the process of opening some of these facilities in the in the coming you know days and weeks uh, to be able to get people back to uh, some of their regular routines while at the same time, again, providing kind of some of that safe distancing that's obviously so important. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the things we were talking about is how we reconcile that guidance with what we're trying to plan for schools, right? Because yeah. schools are indoor environments with lots of people who are coming and going. We certainly have to care for the welfare of students as well as staff and all kinds of things. We know school is 60 days away or more. It feels like forever away, I'm sure, for, for some folks and also not long enough away yep. <laughs> for those who've been struggling with remote learning. Um, where do you see us moving in terms of guidance through DESE and how, how is all this coordination happening? Sure. Well, I think that, uh, you know, DESE is doing the best they can right now with regards to, uh, you know, kind of giving districts uh, some guidance. Uh, pretty broad uh, with regards to uh, heading, uh, heading back uh, uh, to school in the fall. So they're trying to make uh, school districts, I think, understand that there's, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, still a pandemic going on and we want to prepare for, you know, uh, everything from, you know, kids going back to a regular environment to kids going back, you know, every other week, uh, potentially, to, uh, you know, some type of mixture in between there, um, where again, kids can still socially distance, um, and, uh, and of course, you know, you know, make sure people are wearing masks, all of those things. But the big thing I think that I mentioned to you that I, I think that is uh, important to note is that uh, they're making these decisions based upon data today. And the data is moving so rapidly um, every, you know, every day practically as opposed to, um, you know, not just, uh, not just every week or every month. So, um, so the decisions that are being made are right now anyways, I think, uh, appropriate uh, to, to kind of prepare for everything. Um, and then hopefully in the next 60 days, obviously we're going to, you know, as long as we continue to trend in the right direction uh, from a data standpoint of view, uh, we'll be able to create a healthy atmosphere uh, for our kids and our teachers and administrators, et cetera. Yeah, thank you for that. I know this is asking everyone for a lot of patience <clears throat> in terms of people who are wondering what's going to happen. And we'll, we'll continue to talk through this, have you on, we'll continue to have the superintendent on, and the school committee has been actively involved and in, in try and coordinate all things. There has been some really interesting legislation. I'm going to get the number H4820, and I'm always amused by the numbering systems. I know it's not all that you know consequential to the actual nature of it, but I, I think it's always great to see uh, the formality behind it. Sure. Um, that was specifically around some um, ways of making it easier to vote. I assume that was directed because of what we're experiencing with the pandemic and making sure that we're protected in the event that the pandemic requires us to go back to stricter guidance and such. Can you tell us what was included in that legislation? Yeah, so uh, we passed the voting bill uh, initially in the House uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the Senate did some good work on that, uh, I think about a week and a half ago, and then we, uh, we kind of put together uh, each version of the bill uh, and passed those last week. 
and essentially, and by the way, right now it's on the governor's desk and, and I would hope and strongly encourage him to sign the bill. I think it provides for uh, greater accessibility uh, for voting, different voting options uh, for people who want to participate in our elections. I think it uh, provides a, a secure election process, which is really, really important. Um, some of the key components, one of them we've never had before, uh, which is early voting um, uh, for the primary. Uh, we've had that for the general election. We saw that uh, in state elections the last uh, couple of rounds, and uh, we saw how well that can go. Uh, this uh, time around, people will be able to vote early in the primary uh, for about a week uh, prior to, uh, to the election, so that's a good thing. The other uh, change that was made was we're going to mail out um, absentee ballot applications, uh, which essentially will allow uh, anybody who is a registered voter to receive that uh, via mail, fill it out. It goes back to the city clerk's office. The city clerk's office would then log that data into their uh, voter registration database, uh, send out a ballot to the individual. The individual uh, can then vote uh, on the ballot and mail it back in a self ad, uh, self uh, uh, excuse me, they'll have a self-addressed, uh, you know, uh, envelope uh, that will go back to the city clerk's office. The city clerk will then log that ballot in for that uh, individual voter. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, um, you know, that, that creates a secure uh, opportunity and, uh, and make sure that everybody is, uh, is accounted for with regards to the ballots and obviously, so we know who's voting. Excellent. I think it's really important because we don't all know what to expect. And in the event that you may be exposed to someone who is ill and such, knowing that you have these options ahead of time so you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for championing those things. And yeah. um, well, we also did it for just so you know, just for the general election as well. So it's a similar situation for early voting for the general election. Uh, you'll be able to vote early for a couple of weeks uh, leading up to the general election and uh, a similar situation with regards to that people will get a uh, you know an absentee application mailed to them, and if they want to participate, if they want to vote, uh, they can send that application back to the city clerk's office. They'll get a ballot. They will be able to vote, and then be able to mail it back in. Um, so again, all uh, all kind of uh, good things uh, to to make sure we uh, provide accessibility for the ballot uh, to anybody who wants to vote. Make sure we're keeping people safe. Trying to limit the number of people for day of voting. Um, and uh, I think the clerks generally uh, were really supportive. I know I've spoken with the uh, urban city clerk. I've spoken with the Reading city clerk to understand their concerns and whatnot around the bill. And I think uh, most folks are, uh, are excited by some of the changes we made to provide, again, a secure and accessible election for everyone. That's great. I have a, a son who is away at school and um, it has certainly been a mechanism we've used for absentee balance and it's easy and it's secure and I'm glad to see that we're doing that. So thank you. We'll uh, continue to hear from you as the governor hopefully will sign and pass that. Great. Thanks for joining us, Rich. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to welcome Mayor Scott Galvin. We've got a whole bunch of things going on and looking forward to chatting with you about that as well. Good. So let's first and foremost, so um, heard the good news that Mike Anderson will be a judge, I believe was um, what has happened. And so that leaves an open position coming up on Ward for Alderman. And I have to plead ignorance. I have no idea what happens in a situation like this. And I received many questions yeah. from people who were equally interested in understanding that. Can you tell us what happens next? I can tell you. I know Rich has gone through it a couple of times as well, but uh, uh, everybody, not everybody, but I, I probably, like you, got a lot of calls. And I said, I have nothing to do with the re replacement. It's, uh, it's kind of a funny, uh, it's a funny process that the city council will, uh, put a notice out that someone's retired and, and then they'll be taking applications and the city council actually makes the appointment. Uh, and I went through it at least twice when I was on the council, we make the appointment. I know Rich, you may have gone through it a couple of times as well, but it's, uh, it's really an interesting process. Everybody, uh, you get so many people come out and they really, they, everybody's so excited and uh, they want to get involved and, and uh, you know, become an alderman. So it's a, I'm, I know what this, at least a half dozen people who have expressed interest to me and I'm sure there'll be a, you know, at least double that by the time it gets announced. So um, having been on city council, what, how do you decide? I mean, this is, you know, an unusual process and yeah. it sounds like there'll be multiple candidates and that doesn't surprise me. We have a really engaged community. What are, what is the criteria well, some, by which you can look There might, might be like a more obvious replacement. If somebody had, you know, ran for the office and was really involved, you know, that, that, that person sometimes becomes a sentimental favorite, but if it's, if, if 
in this case, Mike has been there for, I think, 10 years at least, and nobody's run against them. So, you know, it's really just going to be a matter of who people know, who they're comfortable, who the aldermen are comfortable with. And uh, it's a lobbying, it's really like a lobbying uh, effort. The one who does the best lobbying and makes the most connections will get the position. How much longer do, is there for this term before it would be up for a general election? Well, they've, we're uh, six months in, right? We, they started in Jan they were all sworn in in January, so it's six months. They'll have 18 months to, to get going and, and you know, do some good things and try to reestablish themselves for the, the next election. But you know, the, the one thing that people have to remember is this is, this is how it was. Uh, the city has that charter, which I think you're familiar with, Samantha, and it's, it's in, in, uh, ingrained in the charter that this is the the um, replacement um, protocol and how it gets done. Some people might say, why well, couldn't, and I, you know, it, it, there would still be time to do, you know, to do an election and have it open for a vote, but it, there's just no process in place to do that. So that's how it goes. That's really interesting. Um, I, and thank you for educating me. I yeah. had no idea how it works. Um, but certainly if people are um, interested in this position, then they should express that and do that quickly to the, yeah. to the city council. When will the decision be made? Well, they haven't put it out yet. So I, I would think tomorrow night. Well, actually, I, you know, Mike hasn't, Mike still has to go through the governance council. Um, and they have to, you know, finalize the uh, or approve the governor's nomination. And Mike's a great choice. I think we'll all agree he's, he's uh, you know, he's, first of all, he's a, he's a great guy, good family man. Uh, he's, he's done a great job in the city council. And uh, he's, he's uh, an excellent family lawyer and uh, he's, he's well-deserving. So I'm happy for him. He's a good friend and uh, I'm sure he'll sail through it. But that process, I would think, would take a couple of weeks. And then, you know, maybe beginning of August, if he's confirmed, when he's confirmed, council will, will then will make the notice and he'll start taking applications and they could, you know, I could, maybe they could fill it within a month. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful to understand that timeline. So September 1st, thereabouts. Okay, well, we wish him well. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it's nice to see someone um, have such success uh, yeah. and work so hard for that. Um, one of the things that um, we have the pride flag was back up and flying and we were in center, um, both Rich and yourself were there and really supportive of the community and I know people really appreciated that. All those close ups of the flagpole. Oh my goodness. I, oh. Nobody realized. Jeez, I, I heard from you right away. That was kind of interesting. She, Bonnie wants to stripe the pole. I said, Oh, geez, that, you know, we have, we do have some traditionalists who want to play in white. So yeah. nice, nice idea. But uh, the DPW will be getting to that and have it painted, but it does, it definitely needs a, a recoat. Yeah, I don't think any of us would have noticed had we not had all those close-up yeah. shots, but it's great to know that we've, we've done. There was also some talk, um, people who were interested in doing something like a um, rainbow crosswalk in one area that some other towns have done. Yeah. What would be the process for having something like that considered? I think they would go to the traffic commission, which is the, uh, once a month, I think now they read once a month. So that would be if somebody wanted to, they would make an application to the, uh, the um, traffic commission. And that would, that's really, you may, I think you make the request down at Bill Campbell's office and then they he'd schedule for the traffic commission. They make a decision on that. Okay. That'd be great. Uh, yep. I appreciate that. And I'm glad to know that our, our flagpole will be painted and proud again yeah. um, soon. Um, I'm just looking at a couple of the questions that came out. I want to get this. Um, Susan had sent a question to me. There has been a lot of discussion about the governor requiring vaccines to enter phase yep. four. And, uh, and she was wondering sort of what that might mean for us in terms of whether it's schools or other environments that we have, you know, sort of city domain over maybe the library or rec programs. Yeah. Would we consider requiring vaccines for participation? You know, that's, that's, that's a good question. I don't know. The, I don't have the answer to that right now. But, but one of the, you know, I know one of the things that you and Rich were, were talking about uh, was the opening. And, and I had been checking the, gov, the, the, the uh, reopening website, you know, when the announcement was made and, and all weekend. And, and then I went on again today. And there is something that's, I think, very encouraging anyway, as it relates to libraries, that they, they are gonna, they're allowing you to open up to 40%. Isn't which is that incredible. great? It's incredible. I, did, I, I don't know where that came from, but, but I didn't see that before the weekend. So now, you know, we're in a whole different mode now where we'll have to, we'll have to look at, uh, you know, what the, what the restrictions are, but they, you know, 
the last thing we had on restrictions, they weren't going to let people use computers. They weren't going to let them sit at desks. Now it's like you sit down on a computer after the person uses it, it has to be clean. So it's a lot. And I don't know where, where, where this total change came from, but it's, a, it's incredibly, um, it's a good news, really. It's really good news that we can open the library and, you know, uh, you get the children's room back open and, and, and have it, act, you know, accessible to the public. So then, then we just have to deal with, you know, the restrictions as far as, you know, people wearing masks and uh, the cleaning and, and, and the uh, physical distancing. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we, I'm kind of at a loss where that came from. It was no well, I, I don't know the answer where it came from. And it's pure yeah. speculation. But I suspect what happened is they're going back now and they're looking at what things are like things, right? So if offices yeah. can start to open up to a certain, you know, amount of space, or you can have a certain number of people in other buildings, that they're trying to sort of create yeah. some commonality across yeah. environments. But it is fantastic news because there's so many yeah. people who depend on the library, not just for entertainment and yeah. research, but also for, you know, job hunting and yeah. printing no. resumes. I, I can only, I can like you only so. speculate and say that, you know, when they, they came out on Thursday and said museums and, um, you know, theaters and like, like the, the like, I'm, it, it was kind of strange that, you know, libraries weren't grouped in at that time. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's excellent it's, news. It's very good news. We'll leave it at that. And we'll, we got to start um, focusing on getting that beauty opened. I love it. Well, I know lots of people will be thrilled yeah. and eager to, eager might, to be in there. <laughs> Maybe they can shut down that Facebook page, <laughs> <laughs> which I haven't gone on, by the way. You get you get those librarians back to work, Scott, yeah. and I promise you that uh, you'll well, have a lot of happy you know, we're, we're looking at we're looking at the um, you know the protocol, and uh, yeah. honestly, it's we'll we'll start looking at it and figure out what needs to be done. Yeah, you know, and all you know, all joking aside, I do think we all want, of course, safety, and we want to protect the staff as much as we want to protect the patrons. But I think it is very good news. It is a um, yeah. It is a center of community and so many people, I think we've all seen how much we miss it when it's not there. So I'm thrilled that we have some um, guidance that allows us to take a closer look at um, reopening some of the some of the building things. Yeah. I also saw that the pools, we have an opening date for that. Of course, there will be some restrictions in terms of number of people. Yeah. But um, I know there's a lot of people who are looking forward to participating in that and some of the rec programs I saw um, drive in. Yeah, there's, uh, movies there's, a and lot, there's a lot more uh, opening, and of course, with that, there's a lot more contact. So, uh, you know, I think we just, you know, I know you, Rich was talking about the data and all that stuff, and we're still, we, we are going to have to be, you know, vigilant and cautious, and, and it's still not, look at, it's still not where it used to be. You, you still have to be uh, respectful of other people's rights and trying to keep everybody healthy. So the masks are going to be important and the social distance thing, and um, you know, ne next year, I keep saying to people, next year, we won't even, we'll be so far past this, we won't even remember it. Yeah, you know, I have been very encouraged personally, as a lot of folks that I've been spoken to about our ability to get comfortable wearing masks and to get comfortable with space and not shaking hands and things that are part of our sort of culture and tradition, right, is to go up and shake somebody's hand yeah. or or give them a hug or a high five or those types of things. But I'm remarkable how well the community has adapted to that because we know that if we wanna get back to work and we wanna be able to support those small businesses and go out and do these things, we have to be cautious right. so that we don't backslide. And I am uh, I know I'm very appreciative of the guidance the state has provided as well as Rich and, and Scott, you and the Board of Health and all the folks who have been working really hard to make sure that we, um, we can remain here. Um, last little question for you. Um, I think we're gonna try and do an episode with the Woburn Business Association. I've got a, um, we've got some work to do to line that up with them and to focus on some of our small businesses in the city. But we know they continue to struggle even with some of the reopening. It's not at full capacity and there are limitations for many of those businesses and, and what they're able to do. Any guidance for us as um, neighbors and community members, what we can do to continue supporting those businesses? The same thing to, you know, to the extent people are comfortable going out to restaurants, you know, and some people aren't, but I know a lot of people do want to get out. Um, and this is definitely the new option where you can sit outside. I, I'd encourage people to, to get out and, you know, to the, if they're comfortable, get out and, you know, support the restaurants and, uh, you know, shop locally with retail and, and uh, you know, the, the common sense things. And, you know, that, that's, that's about all you can do right now. But again, people do have to be comfortable and, 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 and keep themselves safe too. So that's. 
little caveat. We, know, we, we know we can't all afford to do it, but I've been even, you know, trying to do some generous tips, even if it's takeout right. and things. Um, and not everyone is in a position to do that. And we certainly want people to stay within their financial comfort, but where we can buy gift cards or even takeout if you're not comfortable being in restaurants and not just restaurants at the bowling alley opens back up again. And, you know, some of these other more local retail shops are starting to, you know, need us to come back and, yeah. and do some of those things to make sure we reach out. So thank you once again for joining us. Um, this has been some great good news, Rich. We really appreciate the update on voting and we'll continue to keep an eye out for the governor's hopefully signing of that legislation um, yeah. and um, really appreciate the update on the library and stuff. We know um, folks are eager to get back there. So keep us posted on how we can help support um, that in a safe and, and comfortable way. Thank you all so much for joining yeah. us. Yeah. For those See of you who are watching, thank you very much. Scott, did you have something else you wanted to add? See, see you next week. Yeah, see you next week for sure. Um, and thank you all for tuning in to today in Woburn. See you. See you, Rich.